through to. What you see here is a dead ASRock motherboard. This is a 939A8X-M motherboard. It's really about as dead as it gets. It will, uh, however, accept power. The board will power on, but it will um, beep like there is an error in the CMOS. Or at least some sort of memory error. It is not a RAM. And for some reason, if you put in a GPU and you take the GPU out later on, it will power on 25% of the time. So, yeah. Pretty much the board is dead, in my opinion at least. Because it's not, you know, you just can't rely on it anymore. So it's going in the trash. Before it's going in the trash, I just want to, you know, show you this rather unique motherboard for its time. Back in the day, ASRock was known for making some very, very interesting boards, both for Intel and AMD. They made the dual series on socket 939, 754, 478, and maybe even early 775 boards for Intel. This is not one of those dual boards, but I will just explain to you uh, what those dual boards really were about. The dual boards were meant to be, um, you know, sort of cheap boards with a very decent upgrade path. They would release them just after the next generation had been released, so you could use the previous generation processor and RAM technology, and then put in an upgrade board in a slot. It was always somewhere up here, you know, from the the AGP slot, allowing you to use the next generation CPU and the next generation of memory technology. The dual series boards for sockets uh, 754 on AMD's side meant that you could use a 754 CPU with the single channel memory controller DDR by default. Then you could get the upgrade board, which would allow you to upgrade to a socket 939 CPU up to the Athlon 64X2. I believe, maybe it's just a single core, not quite sure, with the dual uh, channel DDR memory architecture. And later on they did the same thing for socket 939 when AIM-2 was around. You have, you would have like a big, uh, there was the, the 939 dual VSTA and the dual as a 939 dual SATA-2 I believe. They had a PCI Express slot, an HEP slot, yeah, they had both. That was really interesting. A bunch of PCI slots, PCI Express X1. And it would allow you to use a socket 939 CPU, Athlon 64, Sempron, Athlon 64 X2, along with, you know, DDR memory controllers, with an upgrade board for AM2 CPUs, up to the dual core chips for socket AM2. Not AM2+, plus, so no... Uh, later phenoms, so like the quad cores and the triple cores, just the dual core chips. But I do believe that they supported up to the uh, later Black Edition uh, AM2 CPUs, as long as you were socket AM2 and a plus. But anyway, that would also allow DDR2 to be used on a board that was initially just a socket 939 from like 2006 or so. They were made in like late 06, early 07, and they were quite popular and they were really unique. The only thing that really let them all down was the chipsets they use. This board uses that same kind of chipset. It's not a VIA chipset. It's not an Intel chipset. It's not an AMD chipset. It's not even an SI frickin' S chipset. It's ULI. Which was basically the same company as ALI, otherwise known as Acer Labs Incorporated. Pretty much, Acer produced North Bridges and South Bridges for these uh, mod boards. And they were rather faulty. The chances of getting a do uh, or a DOA board, as we called it, or pretty much a dead on arrival board, were, well, very, very high. On the other hand, though, if you got a board that worked, chances were that they would pretty much last forever. But yeah, this is not one of those boards that actually work forever. This is actually the second board of this type that I've owned. And uh, it's definitely no exception to the pretty much poor, very poor reliability of the ULI chipsets. It did, you know, those chipsets did pack a lot of features though. 
like those forwards compatibility um, options instead of backwards compatibility, which was rather unique for the time and is unseen these days. I'm looking at you, Intel, with your freaking socket changes every two generations. For the love of fuck. Anyway. So this board actually packs a pretty good, a pretty healthy amount of features. This is a micro ATX board, but it does feature 7.1 channel surround sound. Uh, it's it's an ULI 100 megabit uh, controller. It does have four USB ports and all your legacy ports on it. It has four DDR DIMM slots. Four slots on a, on a board in this price range at the time was pretty much unheard of. It has plenty of headers for uh, you know expanding stuff, and it also has SATA. It's SATA 1.5 gig, so it's not really all that special. But you know, this is supposed to be a low-end board, and it you know did pack all of the latest features pretty much that were available at the time. Because these um, are in fact dual channel, as you can see by the labeling. Two blue ones, two black ones, pretty much ASUS labeling. Because well, we all know that ASRock is the budget division of ASUS. Although the quality control at ASRock at the time was definitely a lot worse. One pro of this board though, it has a rather thick PCB for its time. It's quite a heavy board, even without componentry on it. And I believe, I just have to check real quick by the way, if this is the board that we had to resolder. Or that this is the newer board that we imported from Estonia. Or was it Latvia? I'm not quite sure. I think Latvia, actually. This is another rework board, okay. So this is, in fact, the second board that I owned of this type. It was used by my girlfriend as her home theater PC with a, an Athlon 64X2 3800, or no, actually it was the 4400 plus dual core CPU. Had four gigabytes of DDR RAM in here. And as a video card, she used the 4350 AGP card with HDMI. It worked actually very, very well for a short period of time, unfortunately. Then the board started acting up. And after some diagnosing the freaking problem, um, we pretty much came to the conclusion that the first board was sort of sketchy, so we got rid of it. Or well, we didn't actually get rid of it, we actually had to resolder the audio because the audio chip actually failed. And it actually turned out to be a loose connection on the back side of the board. I'll actually show you where everything went wrong. Need to make sure I can find a real tech chip first. This is the zone where the audio chip is located, and it had a loose connection somewhere around here. One of the copper wires was actually sticking out of the board, so we had to uh, get that resoldered, and then sound works worked again. But in the meantime, we actually ordered a second board of this, and we got it from Latvia. That's actually the board that you see right here. It was a slightly older revision, older BIOS version, but it was well known to be stable. We got it uh, with the driver CD. And after just, I think just a matter of weeks, it actually started exhibiting the same problems as our first board did of this type, the 939A8XM. Uh, because it would just, once you powered it on, it would just go like beep, 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 and, uh, you know, beep the shit out of us. And they always somehow read it back to some sort of corrupted memory in some places. We figured that it would be, uh, that was actually the uh, CMOS because, or well, the BIOS chip was corrupted. Because that's what the uh, manual indicated for the uh, particular beep code that we received. So yeah, but replugging the video card seemed to fix it every single time. Up until, uh, you know, the last week of its use, then it just never came on again. So that's, that's a real shame. These boards were actually jam-packed with features, it's just that they're let down by their uh, north bridge, which just doesn't seem to be able to uh, properly read its diagnostics, I suppose. Because there's no signs of damage on the board anywhere. It's not even all that flexed as the first board was. Yet the first board seemed more reliable. That board was uh, sold on in, uh, in an HTPC case. And this board remained here. 
because I wanted to test it out and see if I could get it back to life again like I did with the first board because I could revive it for some reason and uh, apparently it's still in use today but this board is definitely done for so yeah that was pretty much the history lesson on the very very unique boards that ASRock produced in the mid 2000s and now we should finally be able to reach the point that I wanted to make this video about and that is disassembling this board and chucking it away so first of all we'll just start with uh, removing the RAM, I already took the CMOS battery and it's already in a ditch somewhere dim number one this one's right here this is DDR266, it's a 512 megabyte module of PC2100 that's my testing RAM I suppose because I don't really use PC2100 anymore in anything not even in my upcoming uh, 2006 era project this is a generic brand PC2700 module 512 as well that will go in my memory bag because the memory is tested okay so what will I be borrowing from this thing then well pretty much just the CPU and the heatsink and uh, the bracket holding it on because people still want those because they are compatible with uh, sockets in the 754 and 939 and in some cases the brackets from the later boards can also be used in socket AM2 boards not as often though but some of them can and it's actually very convenient if it's possible but uh, yeah so let's see if we can get this cooler off because this is actually the bitchy kind I think yeah it definitely is this is one of those older coolers probably a 755 cooler 754 I mean where you had to you know push down this tab so you could remove the heat sink from the board unfortunately though a lot of the times you could not get the proper pressure applied so it would not come off what I often do is just I push it down and I pry it forward because quite frankly these things are under a shitload of tension but yeah like I said these are a bitch to take off and this one is definitely not moving see that kind of shit happens and you wound yourself if you're, or injure yourself if you're unlucky as I am but yeah anyway so I will be taking off the heatsink and uh, taking out the CPU I will take off the mounting bracket and that will be the end of this board it will be going in the dumpster but I did want to uh, you know talk about these very special ASRock boards from that time period and this board was pretty much the low end small brother of those later boards that I talked about that I owned I owned a uh, a 939 dual VSTA for a long time. I actually have a video of that on my channel with a dual core CPU as well. And it was a blast, really. I kind of love that board. This is his low end brother. It wasn't so lucky. That's the end of the story. So, public service announcement if you're buying or if you're uh, constructing a sort of a time machine PC from a certain era, do not, and I repeat, do not ever get an ASRock board with a ULI chipset. Verify that before you buy it. Don't get it with VIA. If you can, don't get it with SIS. Get it with an NVIDIA chipset of sorts. They're not all that reliable either, but they, they were the high-end chipsets back in the day, and they pretty much all had PCI Express. HP can be a real bitch to deal with, because cars further are getting scarce these days. But yeah, that's the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I thank you all for watching.